Um, give me a second. Good morning, peoples. <clears throat> Picture behind me is the Morvich family, just for the record. All right. No, no, I think it's forwarded already. That's the lady. Ah, okay. All right, so good morning, everybody. Record, record. Um, we are having a special class today. I would first like, I would like to acknowledge and thank the host, the Morovich family, and the weekly amazing Chabad Solo Ladies Tuesday Day class. I would also like to take this opportunity and acknowledge and thank that my son, this is a personal thank you, um, I would say had his best year of yeshiva school so far by a Rabbi Shemtov in the yeshiva. And a lot of that has to do with his wife because aside of him being an amazing teacher, I know that my son spent many Fabrenians. The teacher invites the students to his house and that connection really goes a long way. And when Mrs. Shemtov asked me to speak about this topic, I feel indebted on top of the fact that we have other solo ladies who asked me to address, um, in my opinion, the question, to narrow down the question is what should we do with Chaim Walder's books? But I think the only way to properly approach this is to take a little step back. And especially as Mrs. Shemtov told me that their women's class is a text-based class. Now, I would hope that when I give a share, I'm properly giving over what I read. We don't make things up, but this is going to be a little bit more text-based. So I want to address three topics, which would lead us into the question of what should one do with the books of Chaim Walder. And the three topics, and again, I'm going to quote from inside and give sources, and that which I am not yet sourcing, challenge me. Um, Parenthetically, it was pushed a very busy a few days, so I mamish didn't have a proper time to sit down and to uh, put my thoughts together. But um, but I'll do my best to really to quote from sources. And if I'm not giving you the, the page and the book, I will give it to you when you so request. Okay, so here are the three topics that I would like to mention. Topic number one is sorry, Rabbi Zion. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna. Um... I'm going to put the PDF that I put together of the sources that you send me if anyone mm -hmm. doesn't have access to it so people okay. can see it. Okay, so I, I did send to Mrs. Shemtov, not, not all, but some of the sources that I would be quoting from today. And so she's posting it on the uh, Mrs. Shemtov's group. Mm -hmm. And the Chabad Solo Ladies, if you would like, I'll post it later. Whatever I post it to her, I'll post it on the uh, Solo Ladies chat. I can send it here on the chat as well, in the Zoom chat. Um, okay. People can... Okay, no, 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 but that Zoom chat that you have is not is not the ladies chat. That's our Gemara. Ah, uh, ah, uh, got it, got it. Okay, no problem. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Topic number one is these are such relevant topics. Is that what does Halacha say about rumors? I'm not saying that Chaim Walder is in the category of rumors, but let's address about the topic of a rumor, which means that when you hear a rumor that so and so did X, Y, or Z. What should one's reaction be halachically? And let me just verbalize the challenge. We are educated, correctly so, not to accept Lashon Hara. 
I'm not speaking about a positive room, I'm speaking about a negative room. So when someone tells you that so-and-so did an amazing mitzvah, believe it. Good, be inspired by it. We're speaking about any type of rumor that is not positive. So when it comes to the great violation of Lashon Hara, which isn't only dependent upon the speaker, part of the sin of the violation of Lashon Hara is the acceptance of. So let me just begin with the beginning. Someone told you that so-and-so is behaving in a very, very terrible way. Even before we get into the severities of the sin, like what's the first gut reaction? Hear no evil and see no evil? Is, is this not what we have been told regarding Lashon Hara? So that's topic number one. And I'm going to question and answer every topic for, for itself before I speak about the other two topics. And the answer to this is very important. And I will begin quoting a Gemara. Unfortunately, I don't remember the page, but it's a Masech to Saita. And we have this a few other places as well. And this, this Gemara is brought down in the Chafetz Chaim. And I'm going to use him as the halachic source when it comes to the rules of Lashon Hara. And listen to this Gemara. There's a fast day called by the fast day of Gedalia ben Achita. We are familiar with the fast day. We live it. Whether we actually fast or not, that's another topic, but uh, there's a tightness. The Gemara says that Gedalia ben Achikam is partially guilty for the fact that he was murdered. He, he is held responsible. Now, just to make it clear that don't come and say the Gemara is blaming the victim. People have to be knowledgeable with the teachings of the Gemara. You have to understand the context of these statements. No, we are not blaming the victim. But when a story happened and we want to learn a lesson from it, then it's very important, just like Lahavdo, if someone was mugged. We're not blaming the victim. But it's good to say, okay, what could I do in the future, not like the person who got mugged, to up the chances of me not getting mugged? That's not blaming the victim. So the Gemara says that what we learned from Gedali ben Achikam is, is that he was told by Yochanan, whose name I forgot, Yochanan ben someone, that people are planning to kill him. And he did not accept that rumor. And since he didn't accept the rumor, he did not take certain precautions that he would have taken had he given more credence to the rumor. Asks the Gemara, but Lashon Hara, it's good to know that all of these topics are mamish discussed. We are a people that we are the wealthiest people in the world. We have a Torah. The Torah is vast. There is no scenario that did not happen in the past that was thoroughly discussed without emotion, simply in halacha. And at times, at times, we are the ones who lack the knowledge. And I'm sure that there are many sources that I don't know. Let me just show you off the cuff what I know. So the Gemara says that Gedalia ben Achikam was not allowed to believe that someone was going to murder him as a fact. But since there was a rumor that someone was planning to murder him, he should have been, I'm using the words in, in the Torah, the words of Gemara, he should have been chayish. Chayish means he should, have, he should have said to himself, there's such a possibility. He should have taken that into account. His complete dismissal of that rumor because of Lashon Hara is part of what led to his death. And therefore, the Chavetz Chaim, who was the one that promoted the virtue of not speaking negatively and not listening to negative speech. He paskins, whether it is in Chavetz Chaim, Pedic Yudzayim, that I remember, and in other places, that when someone says something negative, which is to your toy elas, which means it is to your benefit, it's beneficial for you to know that so-and-so is a predator. It's to your benefit. For you to stay away, for you to make to make sure that your children stay away. That's if people are only got a bit selfish, and if people are at least a little bit selfless, then if it's important for me to know, it's important for my fellow to know because their children are also God's children. Then there is a purpose in um, letting people know that there is such a rumor, because because you have to be highish to that rumor. Now again, when you hear a rumor, it doesn't mean that it's true. It's just, let's call, let's use the words, it's an allegation. But an allegation has weight in halacha, not for you to paskin based on it, but for you to take precautions to protect yourself. Okay. Now, topic number two. Am I allowed to repeat it? I just said I could. Can I repeat the rumor? Just me listening and being chayish, 
for me. And then there's me repeating it. Me repeating it can be something more severe because if I'm repeating the rumor, if the rumor is not true, then I'm violating again Lashon Hara. And the answer for this, these are Simon and Shulchan Aruch. So in Cheshen Mishpat, which is the fourth section of Shulchan Aruch, in Simon Tov Chav Vav, which is 426, it's a very small chapter, it's a small Simon. It actually is comprised of one, one seif, one paragraph. There, the halacha addresses the challenge that we have. How do I balance and weigh saying something which shines a negative light on someone else, Lashon Hara, with the other hand, with my obligation of protecting my fellow from harm. And before I read the Shulchan Aruch, if you have a Chumash, and you go to the portion of Kedoshim, there was one possible. In the same verse where God says, Lo Yiselech Rachel which means don't be a gossiper, right? Don't gossip. This is Vayikra, Parshas Kedoshim, Pedic Yutes, Pasik Tez Zayin. Don't gossip. In the same verse, not the next verse, which is also significant. Don't stand on your fellow's blood. Same verse. Isn't that amazing? You see God's wisdom? I know, I know, I know. I'm saying it, that's it's good to know. What I'm saying we're speaking Rachel? out. Rachel means a gossip. So not Rachel. The source, no, no, not Rachel. Reish Chaf Yudlamid. Rachel, which means a sheep. That was that's the name of a of a Tzedkanias and many other Jewish women that are named after. Okay, so it's amazing that God in the same verse in which God says, "Don't be a gossiper," in the same verse writes, "Don't stand on your fellow's blood." Now let me just interpret the meaning of not standing on your fellow's blood. Not standing on your fellow's blood doesn't mean not to stand on your fellow's blood. That's not the meaning of it, all right? Like every other verse in the Torah, the oral Torah interprets the meaning of a verse. Like when God says, don't work on Shabbos, you have to know what that means. Every verse is meant to be taken literally, but you have to know the pshat. Not to work on Shabbos doesn't mean you have to drive and not walk because walking is more, uh, let's say, cumbersome. It's more, you know, it makes me, it makes me work. That's not the pshat. The pshat of not standing on your fellow's blood means that in contrast to the current um, law of the society that we live in, for those of us who are living chutzlaretz, in which remaining silent is an option, it's not illegal, you're not obligated to take action. If there is something that you can do that will save a life and you don't take that action, then you're standing on your fellow's blood. That's a usoid that we have to be a light upon the nations and we have to in, in, influence that this is a very important law amongst many others that the world will accept when Mashiach will come. And it makes so much sense. I remember getting off the topic for a second that during Hurricane Sandy, I remember that. People who remember that in New York, there was a terrible hurricane and there was real flooding and somewhere near the oil, somewhere in Queens, there was a woman with two children that were mamish in this waters that didn't stop. And she was on someone's porch and she was knocking on their window. And the person in there did not open up. And one of her children, she lost a grip and her children died. And she found the body a few minutes later. And in American law, tragically, the person, mom, she saw her. She was afraid to open the door, did nothing illegal. And by trade law, that's the meaning, don't stand on your fellow's foot. And the fact that Hashem put it in the same verse just underlines the challenge. This is the topic. So where is the line? Where is the line? Sharing, not sharing. The answer is in Shulchan Aruch. It's very clear. And I want to speak specifically about sexual misbehavior, specifically because the halacha differentiates um, any type of misbehavior that can cause other people to lose their lives, which includes a molester, who, as we know today, perhaps people did not know as much as the percent of people who got molested sexually, how many of them commit suicide, and that's on the molester. That's on the shoulders of the molester. It brings them to such an unhealthy mental state that they cannot live, they don't know how to live on. And, 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 and whenever there is a rumor that someone is a molester, 
we are obligated, we are mechoyev, amongst other things, to share that information in order to protect society. And I'm going to go into more details about a room. I'm going to get in a moment. Like, well, you know, the counter is what's just because one person wakes up and they say that so-and-so molested. Now the whole world has to know about it. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, the concept. So if the, the, the content of this rumor won't affect others, whether it's true or not, then rush on it. And even you who heard it, you're not allowed to believe it, but be chayish. Don't be foolish. Could be. If the, the content of the allegation or of the rumor, if it's true, if I'm not saying, but if it's true, can be damaging to others, particularly when it could be damaging to other people's lives, then that's what I want to quote. It says in Shulchan Aruch, Mishpat, in Tav Chavav, that we are obligated to notify others. It's a chiyuv. Let me just read it just for the record. So it says in Shulchan Aruch. Okay, here we go. I mean, one of the examples is that you hear that someone is coming to get you. You hear that someone is coming to, to, uh, to, to rob a neighborhood. And these are robbers that at times would kill. I do want to differentiate whether there's like, you're obligated to notify everyone that so-and-so is coming. And if you have a doubt, you notify. I don't know if it's true. Maybe. Because just like if you hear that, like a value who heard that maybe someone is coming to kill him, he should have taking that into account, not to believe it, you know, not proof, but not to, not to erase it from your mind. If it's, if it's for me important for my life, it's important for me to let you know. If it's completely not a risk to other people, that's where I'm not allowed to share. Not only do I have to take precautions, but I have to share. That's clear. And by the way, these two steps so far, no one debates. I mean, how does the average person determine the real rumor? Okay. 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 Very good. Very good. So let's go about let's go about rumors. More about rumors. Again, the beauty about halacha is is that there's so much in halacha about rumors. There's so much guidance. I'll give you just one example. There are many examples. One example, and I did not send this in the um, in the in the in the uh, footnotes or in the uh, curriculum. It just came to my mind. In the Shulchan Aruch, we have halachas about who is fit to lead the community in prayer. That position is called today a chazan. Even though chazan doesn't mean that, but people call it a chazan or a shliach tzibur. That's just an example of someone who's leading the community in services. And there is, since he's representing the community, he has to be a person who's acting appropriately. And again, it's very simple. There are two steps in acting appropriately. There was someone who sinned in the past, but the tshuva. However, we determine that, just to be aware of that. That's one category of Maybe someone in the past did something wrong, but yes, there is tshuva. How to apply that to our case is a more complex, but it's doable, not complex, and therefore, I don't know. No, we, we know how to deal with this. And then you have someone who's currently sick. And it says in Shulchan Aruch, and Shulchan Aruch is speaking about rumors. So I want to address rumors, like how do we know whether a rumor is credible or not? So I'm going here in the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch, with Oira Chaim, Chapter 53, Simon Nun Gimel. I'm reading, I'm reading, let's go. Seif Vav. Halacha 6. So first of all, there's a, there's, there's a halacha about someone who in the past manslaughtered. There's different details. They took a life. He's allowed, he's allowed to be a shliach tzibur if he did truth. How do we really, really know he did tshuva? We don't really, really know. One of the ways we know if someone did tshuva is if they own their mistake. Simple thing. Just by default. If someone says, yeah, I did it, and I feel terrible, whether they really feel terrible or not, still, halacha deals with that. But just for you to know, we accept that, that state. But if some, in, in, in the case of this case, a person manslaughtered, so he doesn't have to go around saying that 20 years ago, my brakes broke and I killed someone, or whatever the scenario was, by accident. He doesn't have to advertise it, but if he's asked that question, he has to own up. People who hide what they did, that's a halachic indication that they're not doing true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's not get into this right now. Just to, so that person, the truth, it can be actually a 
another another criterion for having being a shliach tzibur. A person who yatsa all of sheimra. Someone who, there is a rumor. This is a tahalacha speaks about rumors. Someone who there is a rumor that they did something not good. Rumors have weight in halach. But it's not the end game. It's just the beginning game. But there's a beginning. So there's dinam over here about someone who upon there's a rumor. Then he writes like this, that if there's only a rumor before we resolve the rumor, then you don't appoint a shliach tzibur. But if he's already in that position, you don't remove him based on the rumor. He said, dinam But if there's only a rumor so far, then you don't give a person a position of leadership. But if they already have a position of leadership, a rumor is not enough to remove the rumor. But what do you do? Rumors have weight. And there are simonim and shulchanarach that speak about rumors. Regarding what should a spouse do if there's a rumor that their spouse is committing adultery. Speaking about the dinam and shulchanarach. These are not far-fetched. These are dinam that are brought down from the Gemara in shulchanarach. And let me just read. This is, I gave you a couple of copies. That in Evan Ezer, there are three types of rumors. Before what we do with it, just to know there are three types of rumors. And I'm going into Evan Ho'ezer. I'm going into the fourth simon, simon Dalid. We're going into Halacha 7 and to Halacha 8, to Halacha 9, Halacha 10. And if you push and read the Halachas, you're going to see what's called. Um, second over here. I think I went to the wrong page. I'm sorry. I'm not, I go further. I'm going into Halacha 15. Halacha 15, see if it as well. For example, Aishas ish sheyatz olar koyel shehoysem is anatachas bayi. There was a married woman, there's a rumor that she committed adultery. As an example, the, 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 the rumors are full in shochanar. And there's halachas, what do you do with the rumor? So there are different words that he uses. There is a koyel, koyel means there's a rumor. Then there's something called the hachol, the hakoyel meranin achadeh. I'm reading outside the machab. Everyone is talking about it. And then you have what we call raglayim l'davar. In this case, in this case, that this is a woman that's behaving beyond the norms. She's called Perutza B'yoyset. Whatever the norms of society is, she doesn't fit into that box. So that leads more credence to the rumors. So first of all, a rumor has weight. We don't pass it based on a rumor. We don't say, oh, there's a rumor, that's the end of the game. But we open up, we open up a tick. And, and, and here, is, here is very important. Simple rules. There's chubas of the Tzamach Tzedek, and he writes like this. The rumor has to be taken to a basin. What rumor has to be taken to a basin? In other words, if the rumor is ongoing for 36 hours without anyone countering the rumor. That's step number one. Was there anyone that countered the rumor? This 36 hours is very much discussed in latter halachic authorities, how we apply this today. It's certainly not 36 hours today. Because in those days, there was no internet, there was no communication. Starting a rumor was a lot harder than, was a lot more difficult. How would you start a rumor? Now it's a lot easier to start a rumor, especially since you can remain anonymous, a lot easier to start a rumor. There's no repercussions if you will be caught to be lying. So just to be aware of it, we know all that. But I'm saying the words in halach, if, there, if when the rumor came out, it was right away countered, then the rumor is dismissed. If the rumor persisted for 36 hours, if it persisted for a certain amount of time and no one countered the rumor, then what the first thing the base that has to determine to the best of their, their ability is, does this person have enemies? And that some tzedek paskins, that other than children, everyone has enemies, which is frames it that way. And you have to find out to the best of your ability, a basin with witnesses, where did the rumor come from? And if you can trace the rumor back to the enemy of the person upon whom there is this rumor, then the basin then will rule that the rumor is not substantial. If the rumor did not come from an enemy, it doesn't mean that this person is guilty of what they did, but now this rumor has more weight. And this more weight has different consequences in halacha when it comes to different scenarios. And I want to focus on molestation specifically. Okay, so far, it's, I, even when I hear something that someone is trying to hurt me or trying to hurt you, 
before I investigate, before I know whether the rumor is for 36 hours, before I know whether it's coming from your enemy, the Gemara says, and the, uh, the Chafetz Chaim Paskins, don't dismiss it in your mind. Don't believe it. You're not saying it's true. You're saying, oh, there's a rumor. It is, it's called a rumor. Or in the words of Shulchan Aruch, it's called a koil. That's kuflamit, a voice. A voice is something. It's not proof. It's not to be dismissed. It's called an allegation. The ways of dismissing an allegation is firstly to see if it persists. The longer it persists, the more credence it has. And you, not you, not me, but a based in is obligated. If this affects, because a rumor will affect that person, true or not, you have to pursue it. You have to make it an investigation. And if it's coming from an enemy, then it should be dismissed. If all it is is an allegation. Great example of this topic and many, many uh, good up to, you know, modern halachic authorities opined when the Kavanaugh case came out. I remember this from the So there, it wasn't about current, it was about the past. This is so there was a rumor that he did something many years ago. Clearly, he was not doing shuva because he was saying he didn't do it. In other words, if, it's, if it would have been proven that it's false, or if halacha would determine there's not enough to substantiate, you have to dismiss it, then it's good. If we would have determined that it's true, then there's a problem that he didn't do true. He did not do true. Either he didn't do it or he did it. Shuba, he didn't do it. Shuba means I own up. I did it and I, and I feel terrible. We discovered then that it's coming from very few people, right? Ultimately, the FBI made an investigation. And let me say like this, I was not part of that investigation, but being that it became politicized, then there's definitely there's a high likelihood that this was coming from his enemies or from Trump's enemies. I'm not saying that as a fact. I'm just giving you an example of what an enemy means. In contrast, and that's important, in contrast, when a child alleges that an adult molested them, it's very difficult for you to make a claim that the child is the enemy. Very difficult. Maybe there are exceptions, but the premise, common sense, which is why halacha, not only bachlau, um, gives a lot of credibility to an allegation about when a person says that they were raped or they were molested, it takes a lot of courage to come out and say that in public. That in itself gives them credibility halachically. And unless you know that they are enemies, their testimony has a lot of weight in halacha. That's even if it was not done in a basin, but it's out there. They don't deny. Yeah, the person says, yeah, I, that's so and so molested. Minimally, it's called a coil. Okay. Now, now let me add to the specific case of Chaim Walden. When it comes to rumors, being that, like we said, that some tzedek paskins, I'll find the tshuva later, based on these rules of the Gemara that is it ongoing? Is it ongoing? And do you have enemies? The more people come out with the same type of allegation, the more credibility it has. Not only because of, um, not only because of, uh, everyone is your enemy, but Pasha, like, like there's, a, there's, you know, one person, two persons, three persons, four persons. It, 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 I'm not saying that he's guilty. I'm just saying it gives more credibility to the rumor. So whenever a person, whenever there's allegations that so and so molested a child, I'm not minimizing the sin of him seducing married women. I'm just speaking specifically here about children because that's mamash pikuach nefesh. That has to be taken on a different level. He's not just ruining a marriage and you know violating grave sins. But if he, if the allegations are true and he molested many, many youngsters, molesting, raping, then he's a person who's a danger for people's lives. He's a he's a raider. He ha- so the more the more credibility it has. Not only was that the case by Chaim Walder, but very importantly in his case, there was a basin led by Rabbi Eliyahu, and with the, with the greatest respect that I have to the Litvisha world. Uh, they're not happy with him right now because, because of this story. But he's a, he's a legitimate Rav. He's a great Rav. And he had women come and testify in front of a Beisden. We have actually recordings online where you can hear what women are saying about how they had an affair with him, how, how he told them to deny it, how he's explaining to them that we're living in a world that you can deny anything. And even if they find a picture of me and you, I'll say it was Photoshopped, 
denied until death. And then he's telling a woman, and if you're going to come out and say that I had an affair with you, I'm going to commit suicide. So he was, he was using this sick blackmail. This is, we hear him. Now, can you Photoshop a tape? Yeah. So, but there's a limit. In other words, when you have a recording, when you have a based in, by Chaim Walder, it's way beyond allegations. It's way beyond an allegation that has weight. This is already a based in that accepted the testimony of 20 some women and children that he had an affair with boys, with girls, with adults, with minors over a tremendous period of time. I'm not saying that Shuva would affect his case, but again, the fact that he denied it, it's going to halakhically. If you deny something, you're not doing Shuva. Which means that if Chaim Walder would not have committed suicide, it would be an obligation upon us to let every human being in the world know that this guy is a rapist and a child molester and stay away and keep your kids away from him. You're mechoyif to do so. You're obligated to do so. Okay. Now comes the third topic. The third topic is, now what? Now what meaning whether he would be living in jail. I want to, I want to before I go to the final topic, now practically right now, when you hear allegations on someone, practically don't go to a basin. Because a based in here in Los Angeles, or in, I would say in, in the Chutzla audits, we don't have the experience and the power, more the power to put an end to the behavior if it's found to be true. Today, me, you, we are obligated. We are obligated to go to the authorities. This is a psag din of all of the big poiskim of our generation. I don't even have to quote sources based on piske dinim of the Rajba. No, it's, there are certain areas in halacha where we have to resolve it within the community, there are certain only financial issues at time that if I would take someone else to the Goyish authorities, I'm violating a terrible violation known as Mesida. I don't want to talk about this right now, but it was already passed concerning sexual allegations, allegations that I am obligated to, to abide by the laws of, you know, if someone comes and tells me I'm a rabbi, I'm Mukhoyev, and I have the mitzvah of calling up the, uh, the local authorities. If you hear a rumor that the mitzvah that you're doing for you not to violate leisam of Adam Riyachas to call the authorities. In other words, when you hear a rumor, maybe the rumor is only coming from one person. Maybe it's coming from your enemy. So I am not saying that just hearing a rumor means you have to plaster this person all over the internet. I'm not saying that. You have to take way to it. And what should you do? Practically, call up the authorities. And even though the, the local authorities are not perfect, okay, but it's, it's good. It has a lot of weight. They have weight to have a halachic weight. And halachic weight. Let me get, share with you a recent quick story. So, so that's why I'm saying call up the authorities. The authorities now, the detectives here in Los Angeles who have experience and who are not biased, we will rely on their on their investigation to determine whether the person is innocent or guilty. Let me give you a, a story without mentioning names. That there was, a, there was a, a woman that was alleging, that is alleging, not was, that is, and I'm chas v'shalom, not minimizing this allegation, that, that, that her ex-husband's current wife is molesting her daughter. What should I do? Now, the, the information was shared with me in the context of helping her raise money for her legal bills. That, that's so what do you do? Oh, it's, there was no need for me to be the reporter because it was reported. It, it, went to the, it went to the authorities and it went to court. And the other side reached out and told me that don't you dare lend any hand in any financial support because these allegations are not true and I'm being persecuted. Or my, my new wife is being persecuted because sometimes it's, it's not true. So what should you do? So what I did is I reached out to a non-partial person. I can tell you, right. I reached out to Mrs. Debbie Fox. I reached out to her a lot. And she gave me great advice. She told me to speak to a big expert. I'm not going to mention the name of the expert. I called up the expert and he told me something so rational. 
He says that in my case, since the case went to court, and so far, her side lost, means someone looked into it, the authorities looked into it, they made a judgment, then right now I have to follow that ruling. She's appealing it. If she'll win the appeal, then I have to side with her. In other words, we have to follow the judicial system. Ideally, it should be judged by a, by a, by a basin. And when Mashiach will come, a basin will judge it. In other words, I'm not saying that the rumor is the end. I'm saying that the rumor is something. I don't know what to do. So in my case, there's a rumor. I heard this rumor. It was countered. It was countered the whole time. This is an example where it's coming from one place, not from many places. And in, in my case, in this specific case, it was, it was brought to the authorities and there was an investigation and there were detectives and there were police and there was the child protective services and it went in front of a judge. And after the judge gives a ruling, then, it, then this person tells me, you have, to, you have to follow a legal system. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that just because the judge, could be the judge made a mistake. But here I feel there's nothing that I need to do right now. I'm following the judge's rule. Okay. And now let me come back over In our case, by Chaim Walder, it's not allegations. It's not only a rumor. In Chaim Walder, I'm saying this based on the fact that there was an investigation by a based in, by Rabbi Elio's based in, and so many people testified that, that, that the crimes that there is allegations about are true. That's it. He was judged already. He was found guilty. Aside of the fact that, thank God, they went to the police, which is Gavaldi, in Israel. Okay, now. Now the question is, based on the above, it's not only rumors. In this case of Chaim Walder, was found guilty in a basin. You have so many people. Not everyone is his enemy. Too many people. Children, Bechlaub, and a child. One child has a lot of credibility. So based on the premise, which is correct, that he molested children and young unmarried women and he seduced a married woman. So what do we do now with his books? And let me point out the irony. The irony here is, is that in the past there were cases where someone was guilty of horrible crimes like this, or maybe not as horrible, and they, and they painted nice pictures, just an example, nice artist. Their art, is art. The content of his books is all about educating children and being ethical and being moral. In other words, it's not, it's not like this is the topic. The topic in which he is guilty of is the topic that he is famous for. I'm just bringing out the, the challenge. And I know compounded with that it's so difficult to find good English books. I'm not minimizing the ones that are out there that it's hard to replace it. Like Rahmanus on the kids, meaning the content is so good. And, and, and so the question now is, what do we do with his books? What do we do with his books? All of this was discussed in, 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 in Poiskim, and you have no idea how many times these things came out. Not, not like this, but similar topics. So again, offhand, this is offhand, Miss you called me up, Mrs. Uh, Shemtev. What came to my mind was the, was the following. And this is from Igeras Moshe, that's from Moshe Feinstein, and that's a very good source to go to. Sometimes it's good to go to the beginning, sometimes it's good to go to the end, because he already quotes in his response of where he got it from. And I'm going to quote the names because he quotes the names. So we're going back, I think, to the 60s. Let me just find it. Whoever has a Igeras Moshe, Evan Ezra, Chalik Aleph. Um, let me find my page over here. Um, it, was, it, was, it was Kufches, right? One second. Oh, it's Hadik Bav. It's responsa. Oh, responsa ninety six. Many people have the sefer in their home, and or if you're having, if you have the book, it's on page <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to laugh to make light. Okay, I'm sorry. This is about someone who was popular. Tafshin Yutes is 1959. In 1959, imagine in America how few good Jewish musicians we had. So there was someone that was famous and he made nice nigun. Then we found out he composed music when he was a good person, a kosher Jew, at least to our knowledge. He made terrible choices. I don't know and I don't care to know. Whatever he did, he did something that he became, oh, not a kosher person. The son he has a bad reputation. Again, I'm going into the reputation because there, Rav Moshe Feinstein understood that there wasn't enough evidence the way we have on Chaim Walter. But still, reputation and rumors, there was enough of a rumor 
based on the fact that no one disputed it, based on the fact that this, it was coming from people that were not his enemies. These are the two halachic criterion. So we accept at least the rumors. So in yesh l'nagnon al chasimis. That was the, can you, you, can you sing his melodies? Much lower scenario, but I'm, I'm making the, the, the comparison because you have the author who is not a kosher person. Again, his non-kosher wasn't concerning nigunim, but could you use his music? And there was a big machlekes. Here I can smile because everything is a machlekes. Who is the big machlekes between Amosha Feinstein and a contemporary of his, who, who, whose name is Menashe Klein or Menashe Hakatan, who wrote a very important series of halachic responses called Mishnah Halachis. And I'm not, I'm not judging who's great or who's not. These are the great halachic authorities of the United States and of the world. So Rav Moshe wrote very strongly, leniently, very strong. I'm going to read it. He was kosher for many years. And he made up many nigunim. And now they sing it by the weddings and b'nei toira. And now, what was this? What was the, it wasn't more than allegations that he began to sing for boys and girls together. And they want to know whether we can sing his music. I don't see any prohibition. Why? Because he composed these melodies prior to his making, prior to his bad choices. And he brings a great proof of all that. What's his great proof? His proof is that there was a Jew by the name of Yechen and Kohen God. Many people are familiar with the holiday of Khan. Whether it's Matisio ben Yechen in Kohen Gadol, whether it's the same Yechen in Kohen Gadol or not, is a debate. He quotes this debate, but it's, a, it's an important debate. Each side has a lot of legs to stand on. There was a Yechen in Kohen Gadol that for 80 years was a Kohen Gadol. Imagine, that means he was 93, and then he made terrible choices. He changed his lifestyle. He became a heretic. During his imagine his, his illustrious career, he enacted many rabbinic laws. And those rabbinic laws, says Rav Moshe, were never shelved. They were never removed prior to his acting out because they were enacted by a person who was a tzaddik when he enacted. Comes along Rav Menashe Klein in Mishnah Halacha, and I think I gave to Mrs. Shemta the book and page, which is important. I'll, 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 let me just find it over here. And uh, yeah, the Mishnah Halacha is in Chelek Vav, and it's Tshuva 108. And he debates that. He says no. And his main, his main point, his main point, um, even concerning the proofs that he brings, is minimally, minimally, there's a concept called shame, reshoyim yirka, which means that the name of the wicked should rot, which is a halachic concept. It's not an emotion speaking, which means that don't give any perpetuity and credence to the name of the wicked. He says that by Yechen and Kain Gadol, no one knows that he is the author of those enactments. So the enactment remained, his takanot remained, no one is giving him credit that doesn't bother us. But if he were to be the link to, to his product, then, then, you can't, then you can't use it. Then you can't use his product not to give continuity. Now, this case over here, certainly more severe, aside of the level of, of, of violation, aside of that, that this person was, was was molesting, raping, sinning while he was composing his books. The books that he compiled, it's not his books, the books that he compiled are, are, not, are not something that he did when he was kosher. There are books that he wrote when he was not kosher that we know of. So that makes it more severe. And, 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 and in conclusion, just to bring up the sources over here, that that it should be taken off the shelf when it has his name on it, 
In my opinion, that's clear. That's clear. Shame to Shon Yirkov. The question is, what do we do now with the content? And that's a very good halachic debate. And I'm sure that there is a, a logic to say that take it off the shelves. At a certain point, reintroduce it without his name. That I get. This concept, this concept, I think, is a, I'm, not, I'm not an authority qualified to give a ruling. But theoretically, again, without real in-depth looking into it, and I'm sure there are other Judy Prudence chuvas regarding similar cases, but this would be a very good source of Ramesha Feinstein and Menashe Cotton debating whether you can use music of a certain individual. And there, the name was associated to the music. And Ramesha said yes, because he composed the music when he was okay. And Menashe Klein says no. Even Menashe Klein, if no one would know that he composed the music, I don't think he would oppose it. We have, this is my own logic speaking, that we have, someone asked me this question last week, this is what came to my mind. And everyone knows this, that in Chagiga, we learn about a person by the name of Alicia Ben Abuya. Alicia Ben Abuya was a great Tana. He was a big tzaddik. He was a great scholar. He had tremendous students, including Debbie Meir, that had Meir Valanes, that we all have the schools to visit in Tavaria, Erda Koydish. And he became a heretic. I'm not comparing since. He became a heretic. The other sages disassociated. Rav Meir continued to learn from him. And Rav Meir said, it's like having a fruit. Take the good and throw out the bad. But he's no longer called by his name. He's called Acher. I'm using this just as another logic that if there's something to be learned, I don't believe in burning books, Michal. I think that, that if there's good content, there's definitely, in my mind, a lot to say that it should be saved, but not in its current format. Even Rab Meir no longer called him by his name to make sure that his name has no linkage with anything in our people. I think this is a tremendous opportunity to speak to our children about how someone whose life's mission was to help and protect children, that person can be a, a perpetrator. And again, you have to have a good psychologist. I, I, I think that Mrs. Debbie Fax is amazing and I'm sure there are other great people and organizations. I know it's a balance. We can't have our children living in fear, but every now and then, to, to knowledge that such people are out there, knowledge that such people are out there, the person that you think you can trust the most is the person that you can trust the least will only benefit our children remaining more safe unless they are overwhelmed and every day you're hacking them about molestation, there's a certain limit to it. But I know that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to speak to our children, in my opinion, how this individual you know, chose, even though God gave him an animal soul, he chose to go down a certain path which only the greatest and most wicked people in mankind ever went down. It's only befitting that someone like this committed suicide. It's the perfect ending of this world for him. And, uh, and, 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 and our children should know that no matter how good his books are, that coming from such a person, we want to give no credence, no credibility, no koyach, no zuchus, no merit to someone like that. And I would even tell my kids that at some point, we're going we're gonna to take the content, we're going to erase his name, and we're going to reintroduce it. There's something good to be learned. And the good didn't even come from him. The good came from other kids. The good in the books are not from him. The good in the books are simply knowing how to write down other people's narratives. Other people, other people didn't sin. So there's another reason why I don't think the book should be burnt. I don't think the content should be lost, but it should be reformatted. Maybe a bigger expert should add something, should change it a little bit to save the good, not linking it to his name, based on based on emotion. And even Menashe Cotton, Menashe Cotton for sure says it's us. Moshe said it's, it's muted only because he composed it when he was a kosher person. Now, without mentioning names, it's not Negea. I know that this is a, a topic that will lead to other topics because there are other people, maybe they lived a little bit, um, you know, not that many years ago, they're no longer alive, upon whom there are terrible allegations of also misbehavior, not of raping kids, but of, of, of having affairs with many, many, many married women. And there's a lot of music that's out there. 
And yeah, there's a question mark. This is a good topic to discuss. How kosher is that music if it's associated with that person's name? I think this is a very healthy topic. The takeaway is, is that this has been discussed in the past. So people don't need to get emotional. People have to open up the books. We are the people of the book. Find more responsa from people on the caliber of Rav Moshe Feinstein and of Manasseh Akotin, or go back a generation or two. And I'm sure maybe such a case even happened in the past. Molestation tragically was always there. You know, and you read stories, you read truths about it, how, how they were dealt with. Maybe let's find out. Maybe there's a Noi de Yehuda somewhere. Maybe there's a response of someone that was dealing with the Torah that was written by a molester. I'm almost sure this is out. You simply have to find it. I'm not saying that you have to apply it, but we, we have duty prudence. In other words, this is a Torah question, and there's so much content that we have to just gather and look at and either make a little bit of a bridge or mamish the same exact thing and base the halachic ruling from it. Any questions? Yeah, two questions I had. Um, can you just explain again what the basis, you said that nowadays we should be going to secular court and, and trust whatever the secular court um, conclusion that they come to. Like, can you explain again the basis in halacha for trusting the secular court's system yeah. as opposed to a based in? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I don't like the word trust. I want to use the word go to, the go to. When, 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 there is any, um, when there's any activity that's security related, securely related, the fact is, based in has no power to protect you. If someone is breaking into your home, think about it that way. If someone right now, not you, if someone is breaking into Reuven's home right now, calling up a based in doesn't make sense because what, what do you expect for the based in to do? What could they do? They can't. You have no one to call. And on the other hand, you have to protect yourself. You're obligated to protect yourself. And based on the truth of the Rajbo, which is based in Mrs. Shemtov on a Gemara that I remember in, in Bava Metzia, how the son of the Rav Shimon Bar Yerchoi, the son of Rav Shimon Bar Yerchoi worked for the Roman government catching thieves. He was a uh, policeman. People criticized him. You're working for the Goyish government. And he said, and he, and he worked for the Goyish. He worked as a policeman. And, and uh, this is just the source in the Gemara. But the halacha is that when we live in a society that does not discriminate against Jews, which is the United States, there isn't racism built into the government against the Jewish people, um, then uh, you are allowed to be an IRS agent. You're allowed to be a policeman, even though it means you're pulling over uh, a Jew that's speeding and giving him a ticket and reporting him. And similarly, if I'm a citizen, anything that's related to security, I'm obligated to go to the authorities because there is no one else to go to. When it comes to allegations that someone is, 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 is a molester, all right, he's not knocking on my window right now, but he will knock on someone's window. He will knock on someone. Now, I'm not saying for sure that he did it, but the only organ that we have available to us to put a stop to it is only the secular courts. Basin doesn't have such a power. It means even if they will investigate and halachically determine, now what? The beauty about the secular courts here is, is that they have a lot of experience. Their initial investigation will determine whether they're going to open up a file against the person. And by the way, that also has a halachic effect. That means if someone is reported to the, to the Child Protective Services and they don't pursue it, that is a halachic reason to know that there is no validity to it. That disproved the rumor because it was looked into and their threshold is very, very weak. That means many, many people we know that are taka innocent are being investigated. Just being investigated doesn't mean you're guilty, but if they don't even investigate, that's the way we do it. It's based, Mr. Shantam, it's based on a truth of the Rajman. I sent it in the curriculum that I sent. And everyone quotes him, but it's not just, it's, it's a common, it, it, the, the topic was thoroughly discussed way too late, we can say, but at least better late than ever. It was discussed, I think it was 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And all of the great halachic authorities, beginning with, let's go with Rabbi Yelayashev. Let's consider Rabbi Yelayashev, the, the world poisic after Rabbi Yashif Feinstein. That based on that, he advocates is an obligation to go to the authorities when it comes to molestation because it's a safety issue. Okay. Yeah, another actually two more questions. So another question was that so you said that in the case of Walter, the basin already you know had judged him. And I've heard yeah. people say that you know you can't have you can't judge someone if they're not there to defend themselves. Um, is that can you address that? <laughs> well, 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 yeah, I can address that. Yeah, so so very good. So there's different stages in a in a basin's ruling. Very good. But, but when the Beisden, he, he was called to come to Beisden. He was given that opportunity. He didn't come to Beisden. The Beisden didn't even want to call him because
because it was such outrageous allegations that they felt that they'll make a little bit of a, an investigation and they'll know that it's not true. But they ran after the source of the rumor, you know, and their goal was, they thought it's maybe coming from one person or from two people. If they would have found out that that person is an enemy, again, this is determined in halacha, they would have dismissed it. But what turned out was not only were there, it wasn't two, it wasn't three, it was four, five, six, boom. So first they, 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 they opened that up and then they called him to a basement and he refused to come. So let me say this way, Mr. Shemtev, if he would have been the head of the Sanhedrin, you're right, he did not have enough to sentence him to die. Correct. But there is a based in that interrogated or, or they interviewed, uh, inter interrogated, they interviewed so many different people, the based in came to the conclusion that this guy is guilty. Not to put him to death, but enough for, for me as an outsider to say that this goes way beyond a rumor that does an end. This is way beyond the rumor. This was already investigated by a basement. I want to go further. Again, I give a lot of credence to the whether the police will open up a file. The Israeli police don't think, I mean, it's tragically, I don't want to make light of it. You know, when you have a divorce, for example, and then during a nasty divorce, one spouse says, oh, my spouse was molesting my kid. Right? Yeah, go to the police. But I'm saying, this is a case where there's an enemy. You, you see, the police opened up a tick in Israel they were after him. The police are not after people unless they already feel that there's enough evidence to find a person guilty. Here in America, the DA won't waste their money unless they feel they feel that they have a case. So yes, halakhically, that has weight. Okay, then one more question um, that I think comes up a lot with this is that when you, we're talking about you know spreading information about someone in order to protect society, people say, well, often the family of that person is also hurt in the process. Um, you're not just hurting the, the perpetrator, but also his family. Um, yeah, well, could you address that? Let me respond that the one who's hurting his family, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, first of all, we are speaking about sexual molestation. Let's make it very clear. Because sexual molestation falls into the category of a murder. I'm not minimizing other sins or the trauma or the pain, but if an adult was seduced by someone, we're not putting that on the same shelf as, as, as an adult raping a child, molesting a child. And, and, and the guilty one of hurting the family is the molester. It's completely, fully on the molester. Fully on the molester. Shame on him. I'm a khoi. Listen, can you, can you imagine there was someone on my block that has a tendency to murder? And you know about it and you don't tell me. Your, 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 your silence is not an option. And if you don't know for sure, then you should tell me there are allegations. And then you should give it to the police. And I can just add, and if the police comes out here and the courts find him innocent, I think you should call the people and let them know that he was found innocent. I'm not saying that your job finished just by sharing the bad news. And I'm not saying that just because he's innocent is that I for sure he's innocent. It's not full proof, but you should share that. And it has halachic weight. In areas of security where we go to the secular courts, then we rely on that. If not, we're living in a world of chaos and we're not allowed to live in a world of chaos. We have to work with the powers that are, that are, are right. In areas where we go to the basin, which is definitely ideal, we work with the basin, which can also make mistakes, but you work with them. If they find guilty, you have to back them up. If they find someone innocent, you back them up. And in those areas nowadays that we are obligated to work with the civil authorities and with the criminal, with the secular authorities, then we have to back them up for good and bad. Sure. Children, you're a mandated reporter. That means that if, if someone finds out that you knew something and did not report it, you're liable for that. So what 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 Mrs. Nathan, what, what Mrs. Nathanson is saying is, is that just to be aware that if a mandated reporter doesn't report, unlike my case of Sandy, um, Isaacs, I'm sorry, um, that my uh, I'm sorry, that that here, yeah, even by the Goyesha law, silence is not an option. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah, not always, even in America. I'm a khuif to say now, if the trader would not allow me to speak up, if the trader would not allow me, just because I might go to jail doesn't justify me speaking up. The trader demands for you to speak up. Loi Samoy al Damriyacha. Says the Shulchan Aruch that if you know that someone else might be injured, might. The case of the Shulchan Aruch is there is like a Ghana from the neighborhood and he's breaking into homes. You're obligated to notify your block. And we, I, don't, I have a WhatsApp block on my block. And that's what we do. 
that there is a car. We're not saying that the person in the car is a ganav. We're saying suspicious. And there's the decency of letting mm-hmm. everyone know about it. You're doing no harm. You're not saying that person is, is guilty, but it's, there's a mitzvah to share with the people in your social network that there is a potential danger, not because you are damning them to be dangerous. You are saying there's a potential. And be aware, you're mechoyev to do so. And the one who li- listens, that's going back to the beginning of what we learned, that's the big yesoid of the Chafetz Chaim based on the Gemara about Gedali ben Achikam. Gedali ben Achikam didn't know that, that he's going to get killed, but he should have taken it into account. And don't abuse Lashon Hara by saying, ah, Lashon Hara, I'm erasing it. Don't erase it. That balance is not something that we have to have. And you know what? It resonates because it's just common sense. Chaim Alder was actually found guilty in a base. That's even worse. But even if not, even if not, I'm saying, therefore, since he was found guilty, shame to Shem Yirka, I, I don't think I don't think that we should keep his books in the format that it's at. He should become at best like Acher. People should, even if he's, his title will be quoted, it should not, no one should know it's coming from him, if, if it's okay. And whoever, everyone is welcome to the fully disagree, that would be amazing. This is a good debate, that's very sad, but in the context of the Torah, it's good, it's good, it's good. And, and, and to push it, to find out, speak to people that are more learned and find out other sources. What we are really looking for is Judy Prudence. Find out cases that happen, mamish the same or similar. I think the case that I brought is relatively similar. If I brought anything really new to the table, it's just to make people aware of the Yigaras Moshe and the, and, and the Mishnah Halacha. Givaldic. Then it's not a motion. Ah, this was already debated. I think Bela has her hand up. Or... Hi, thank you. Okay, this is not a, a case about molestation, but it made me think about the case of um, Sholem Mordechai Rubashkin. And I read his book and I listened to him speak and it was very clear that the government, they went after him with false charges and they, so how can we rely solely on the government and on the, the process of you know, judicial law if such things can happen? The big difference between, between the Tzaddik Rubashkin and Lahavdel the Russia Chaim is that even if, even if the allegations would have been true, he was no danger to any society. So I don't want to use his name, but if someone indeed was dishonest with the banks or for federal money, right? You can't even have this conversation on, in the same breath. Uh, and, 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 and we have to be honest with the government. But it's not behaving or not behaving. And by the way, Bela, that's a great proof to my point that it became known. The fact that so many other judges, so many other judges, judges that are that the one of skin in the game said that there was a bias against them. You see, it came out. I would actually use this as a proof that in the world that we live in today, in other words, if there would have been uh, people that would have discredited these, these 23 women, then, then that's a different conversation. No one is discrediting them. No one. You can't. It's too many. 20, 20 some people. And he raped many more. That's what the, many people are ashamed to come out. I can't. I think that rumors have credence because even if a judge makes a mistake, there's pushback if many people feel it's wrong. There was no pushback defending him other than using, abusing Lashon Hara, which is a terrible thing, which is a terrible mistake that people make. What's very weird about this situation for me personally, I, every time I ever saw his books, I, I had a, a strong aversion to them because of my personal experience that you know about I could not even look at his Guys, books. we have amongst us a prophetess. Bela, it's amazing. I'm going to make use of you. I'm going to go after your six cents. Come on, Luke. I, I'm saying to you, go. go. So the bottom line is, go after, go after your gut feel. I don't have that madrega. I have his books. I had his books in my house, and I was impressed. Uh, what can I tell you? I was good. I, I, I couldn't look at them. I couldn't read them. I couldn't buy them at all. Sure. Um. <laughs> First, do you throw the books in the garbage? No. <laughs> I, would say, I, would, I, I really mean to shelve them. I, I, I didn't say to throw them away. I think to put, put them in a box, put them away. Don't throw them in the garbage. It's good. I don't believe in boring books. It's kind of my opinion. <laughs> what I'm saying is... is no, because it, particularly when it comes to his books, he's a compiler. It's a big difference. 
He's simply printing other people's stories. They're not even his. No, 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 no. no. I, would, I, would, I would shelve them and figure out. I think there's going to be some sort of big ruling about what to do with them. I don't think we're ready to throw completely. I think okay. it's good to make a stance. Right. Put it away. So the second, the second question I have is, what happens to Nishama? I understand that we need to, we need to share so that as a learning thing, but like I feel like even just like um, like you don't learn Torah in order not to hurt that person. So I hear all of this, and obviously it's terrible, and he did terrible things. But now that you know he was sick, to himself. It's, he can't hurt anyone anymore. Is there anywhere in us where we feel that we need to protect his Shoshana from the extended judgment? Okay, so just for people who didn't hear, so Shoshana wants to know, is there any, is there any Indian now that the Iker is dealt with, which is he's no longer a threat because he, he killed himself. Um, is there any virtue in helping his Nishama have an Aliyah in any way, shape or form? And I, I, would, I, I, would, I would say, that certainly not in public, certainly not in public, because it, because the victims and people that are related to victims, the pain that they experience as a young woman committed suicide, after he committed suicide, because of this terrible eulogy that he was given by certain prominent rabbinic leaders. Why do you think they did that? Because they are terribly mistaken. I want to conclude like this, that, and I know this is a, this is so important, and it irritates the men, not just the women. That since when I remember, since whenever there's a tragedy and people get together and this warp thinking, what comes up? You, you know this woman who did sneers, the inches. At this, they got killed in more sneers. So for sneers, these people make the biggest, if it's that inch, it's an inch like this. And the mechitza has to go to the heavens. That's not tolerated. But tolerating these people that are mamish, mamish, not the way, not... They, they, these are the people that are raping and the Rahman al Islam. And, and it's, it's just mind boggling. There's something crazy that has to be rectified. This is the cause. The cause is, is that we don't take a stand against it. And part of the stand is there has to be a little bit of an extreme. I'm not saying burning. I'm saying so, so thinking about being Masak in his soul. No, I'm saying, I'm saying that I'm, I'm, what you're saying is not wrong. And could be there's a tzaddik out there. I want to say for me, for me, my mission is, 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 is to use this as an example of people who might have good intentions, who are terribly mistaken by not giving credence to these, even if it's only allegations. The Shulchan Aruch is filled with it. What the heck, what's wrong with these people? And, 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 and giving credence gives them power. And that lends hand, that's the Lissam of Adam Riyacha. If there are calamities in the Jewish people because of modesty, this is the modesty that there are people I'm not saying it's only men, there are men and there are women and there are allegations that they are molesters and we're not doing enough to uproot them. This, this is the reason why if you want to link it to our fault, that's our fault. That's what has to be rectified and our generation is rectified. And then the next world, the I don't care about him. I really... The, but like, Hashem created this Nishama and this Nishama made horrible, horrible, horrible... I would, put him, I would put him in the category of someone who mass murdered Jews. So instead of speaking about Chaim Mordor... What about a Malik or what? So one second, what about Tim Hamalik? What about Tim Hamalik? So, okay, okay, I want to use that. Amalek, Amalek is the exception that God said we should do genocide. By the way, Amalek, God said to kill the men and the women and the children and the infants and the animals. That's only for Amalek. You can't say he's Amalek. He's a mass murderer. He's a mass, well, who was the big mass murderer in America? I don't know enough American culture. Who's a famous mass murderer? Jeffrey Thomas. Jeffrey Thomas. Whoever he is. Huh? Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. So Jeffrey Dahmer. So I'm saying, so I think people who want to do good, they should focus their compassion towards the victims of Jeffrey Dahmer. That's the my. But people want to do good. Like, what's the message? An opportunity to speak to our kids. Dafka, that even someone who's your therapist, who's your therapist, who's trying to help you because you got molested, he might molest you. Or she might molest you. To be aware of that. You have to have another therapist to tell you how to word it, not to scare the heck out of our kids, I know. But I'm saying it's good, at least for us adults, to say we're living in an oil mass shaker and to be aware of that, that adds protection. Yeah, bracha. Hi, Rabbi. So my kids, uh, they loved his books a couple of years ago. I, I think a year ago, my daughter was like Googling and she asked, she, you know, are the stories real? And it wasn't so clear and she got very disappointed. Um, 
what I'm saying is I don't feel he was just a compiler. And um, I think his energy is invested in the stories. You know, I think he tweaked the stories. I feel um, it wasn't clear. So it's not like he just compiled the stories that uh-huh. he wrote. Yeah, I, I, what you're saying is I'm not debating with what you're saying. See, I, I... So with, with that, I feel, I mean, very uncomfortable with like keeping his books, you know, because I'm like yeah. how... The energy of you're not comfortable. Person. If you're not comfortable, I'm not saying for you to keep books that you're not comfortable with. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying do you have to keep his books. Well, I mean to right. say I don't see why I don't see any halachic uh, source for you to be chayev to burn his books. I don't believe in book burning. No, for sure. No, I don't need to burn. I know my daughter was really she wanted to step on them. I said we don't need to do that, you know, because she got sure. she felt very betrayed, right? Because yes, she, she loved his books, you know. Yeah. So I think the kids' reactions, like, you know. But I just, whatever, I just can't imagine a future where these stories could be, could be fixed in a way that his energy is not invested. There, there'll always be like a trace okay, of like, we don't it. know, we don't know. I, I would say that That's time, just my opinion. No, I, I agree with you. I'm not saying that what will happen. I'm saying that first, now take it off your shelves, right now. Then we'll see, then we'll see later. There's no doubt that someone who's a victim and he has many victims that we don't know of, that when the victims will see a Jew like me and a Jew like you take his books off the shelf, we are helping them. We're doing a mitzvah for them. They're saying that we're standing with them. Mm -hmm. And when we leave the books on the shelves, not that we're doing it purposefully. It's like we got the wrong priorities. The ikir are the victims. The the, the end, at some day, Yashko also will be elevated at the end. But that's not my business. My business is first... I don't have time to be compassionate for everyone. The ikir is to be stand with the victims of, 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 his, of his terrible crimes. And yeah, I think it's a mitzvah to take it off the shelves. Again, I'm just not against book burning and whether we yeah. can make good of a straight off. We'll see. I'm not, we'll see. Let's wait and see what happens. Got it. Thank Chabra, you. I got to run. I thank you all for being here. Thank you so much.